Amen. So, <laughs> I'm wearing the blue suit that uh, makes me not be able to move at all. But <laughs> the reasoning is, is because when we went to the park event where we were uh, part of the other churches and ministering out there, Benaya started grabbing out his suit. He jumped up because it's in the top drawer. So he's pulling it out. I'm like, what are you doing, buddy? He's like, well, we got to dress like together. And I'm like, well, we're going to a park. It's going to be 100 degrees. <laughs> and he's like, well, can we wear it Sunday together? And so I was like, all right, buddy. So uh, that's why I'm wearing this one today. <laughs> so I get scared whenever I, I move around. It, it kind of feels like, you know, if you're buttoned it up. It's like you can't move. And so sometimes I started thinking, I was like, it's like some of us with the Holy Spirit, we just don't let him, you know, like, oh, no. You know, we, we say, hey, stay down. No, I don't want to look weird. And, like, and it just pulls us together. And we all just want to just, just be able to walk along. And in and, and our Christianity, we want to wear the suit, look pretty. <laughs> But we don't want to, to go out of our comfort zone. We don't want to move around. I can't move around today because if I do, it won't be pretty. <laughs> She's got a needle on thread if we have to do a timeout. <laughs> so, so today, we're going to be a robot. But we're going to let the spirit move at the same time somehow. But uh, when I was studying this week, I wanted to do the last chapter of Habakkuk. And then I realized... To get the full understanding of it, we probably should go to the beginning, you know, instead of just give you the ending, because the ending's all, yay, it's happy, it's good to go, uh, encouraging. But then I was like, I can't just throw out the, without the, the beginning of it. And so, after I was going to start the sermon and, and just hit you with the, the good and pretty and the, the uplifting, I realized we have to go to the beginning to realize what we've missed and, and what we've gone through to get to that part where it is sweet. You know, we have to go through the bitter at times to realize the sweet that we have. And so when doing that, I realized, you know what, Habakkuk's only three chapters. Maybe we should just start in Habakkuk. And so that is what we are going to do. And so uh, I found that video and just threw our name at the end of it and <laughs> called it good. So sorry. <laughs> so whoever that is, I appreciate it. So we'll be in Habakkuk for a little bit. But like I said, it's only three chapters, so it's a small chapter. Everybody, uh, even outside of the church, for the most part, knows who Jonah is. And, and they, they know the story of Jonah because they're taught that in uh, Sunday school. But Habakkuk is not taught in Sunday school for the most part. <laughs> and so a lot of people are like, who is this guy? Well, he was a minor prophet. And so it's uh, important to understand the whole Bible. And he was actually the last minor prophet to preach in Judah in the southern kingdom before the final Babylonian invasion. So we're going to get a little bit of a history, but I'm not going to go too deep into it because we're like, whoa, what, how does this apply to our lives today? <clears throat> but this is before that uh, Babylonian invasion, and we've talked a lot about that with Jeremiah and uh, how he was praising in, in that 70 years of being in Babylon. We talked about that a little bit. So hopefully this will be a refresher at times. But this is before that invasion on Judah. They attacked three separate times before carrying the Jews back to Babylon in captivity in around 50 or 586 B.C., and then ministering in the days immediately preceding Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion. <laughs> so everybody's like, what's this history lesson about? But to understand what's going on, to understand the, the political era that they were dealing with and who he was speaking to, it's important to know what was going around culturally. This is, so what happened after King Solomon's death, we know King Solomon was the, the wisest king ever, but... <clears throat> He made some mistakes, and he married some women he shouldn't have married, and he married a lot of them. I think, <laughs> what, 300 wives and 700 concubines? So being wise, he wasn't really too wise, but being the wisest man on earth, it's like, man, we are not going to... Anyway, <laughs> so the kingdom split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which the northern kingdom kept the name Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah, which was the tribe that dominated the new kingdom at that time. So when we talk about minor prophets and major prophets, they all have a huge impact and they're all important, just as important, but they call them minor because there wasn't that much uh, book that they wrote. And so the 12 minor prophets are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And so the, the major prophets, because their books are long, almost 44 chapters or so, is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and they throw in Lamentations in there. And so those is a little bit about the Bible. So we have this minor prophet teaching uh, in this time. So we talked about Judah. Judah was losing the word of God. We talked about how they didn't have the Bible, they didn't have the scriptures, and how they, they didn't have an importance on the word of God, and they didn't have it hidden in their hearts. And so the word of God was, 
not found. And so when they are, Josiah, King Josiah, I talk about this, when he was remodeling the temple of the Lord, they found this scroll and they went over to him and said, hey, king, we have found this scroll. It's the copy of the law of Moses. So they found the word of God. And it's, they're like, what is that? It was almost a novelty. It's like, wow, we actually have one of those? We actually have the word of God in our house somewhere? Like, yeah, here. And Josiah was a good king at the time. And what happens is in 2 Chronicles 34, 14, it says, And now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hekiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. So they find this, they find the scripture. So they did not have a copy of the law. They didn't know where it was. And this was a, hey, this was a aha moment. They were like, we found the word of God. What should we do? We give it to the king. And the king reads it. And see, all the kings beforehand were evil. And so they didn't uh, reverence the Bible. And they started doing idol worship. And when that happens, you start to forget about the word of God. And then it gets put on the shelf over here. And then you start doing something else. And then something comes along the way. And then, then something else goes on top of it. And then the Bible is hidden. The word of God is no longer important. And that's why we talk about all the time to be in the word of God. So if the Bible was taken from us, we would know it in our hearts. No, I know what the Bible says. And so with the evil kings and the idol worshiping, all the Bibles and all the scriptures were not important and put away and then probably picked up with the trash and thrown out. And so that's what's going on. They could not find a Bible and no one was searching for it. No one wanted one. They could have just gone to mine or Marty's house and they would have found a few of them. But we're not there. So... <laughs> I'm hoping we as Americans don't get to that point where the Bible just collects dust. I have plenty of Bibles that are collecting dust because those are just on the shelves. But, you know, I have the, my Bibles that I'm into and reading. And most of us should have it on our phone. And we should be reading it on our phones too. But it's very important to have, I believe, and Marty, I guess, would agree too, to have a physical copy. He would also say to make sure you have a good cowhide on it. <laughs> but it's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside that's really important. But uh, I hope that we don't go that way. And I see America, that's the way it's going with everything that's going on. With, and it just becomes a real problem when no one missed the Bible. No one said, hey, I haven't seen a Bible in a while. I haven't heard the scriptures in a while. It's just no one, it was not on their minds and no one cared. So jo Josiah, he has the word read to him. He realized how far Judah was going away from where they should be. And he kept, and he wept before the Lord. When he heard this, he realized like, wow. We have idols, we, we've put up tower, we're doing everything wrong. And he says, we've got to do it right. And so he puts back into place, they forgot to do the festivals, they forgot to do Passover, they forgot to do Yom Kippur, they forgot to do all those things. So they were not remembering the crossing of the Red Sea, it would have been enough. They're like, what would have been enough? What are you talking about? And so it's important. So he's like, hey, let's put all these festivals back into place once again. And there seemed to have a revival in the land. It's like, whoa, we're getting back together. We're going to finally have God. But in reality, the people were only going through the motions. They were doing the rituals as just a ritual. Oh, we have to do this because the king told us to do this. They were worried about the outside appearance and not the inside, not what's on the inside. And so they were going through the motions. And this is where it happens. Is So this is the time where we have a few of the minor prophets, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and some of the others on the scene that are talking to the people saying, hey, you need the word of God. You need to do this. And they all had their specific messages to the people. And they were calling them to true spirituality. They said, hey, you need to have a relationship with my God. Not just go through the motions. Not just to open up the communion. You know, it's, e well, it's not really easy to open up our communion at times. <laughs> but it's easy once it's open to, oh, I took communion. But it's to, to mean it, to, to understand what you're partaking in. And, and that's what these prophets were saying. It's like, hey, you need to understand what these are meant for. You need to understand what Passover was. It was because you were saved. You were redeemed. And he said, you need to understand this. And the problem is Josiah dies. And then an evil king comes and rules again. And his name is Jehovah. Hoakim, and we talked about him. This is where Jeremiah gives him the word of God, gives him the word, and you know what he does? He reads and says, I don't like this. He cuts it up and throws it into the hearth. He throws it into the fire and burns the word of God. You see what's happening now? The good king dies off, and the bad king's like, hey, you know what? I don't want to hear the word of God. I don't want to hear that I'm doing something wrong. I want to do the way I want to do. And so he cuts up the word of God, and I preached about that a couple sermons ago. And so this is the time that uh, Habakkuk is living in and preaching during the king, the reign, it is believed, of Jehoiakim, an evil king <laughs> that is burning the word of God after they just <laughs> found it and now it's cut up and now idols are coming back up and this is where we have 
Habakkuk coming into play and saying, I gotta, I gotta witness all this. I've gotta see all this. And so this means that he would preach in a world where spirituality was declining. He would be preaching in a world where idol worship was raising up, where sin was abounding everywhere, where the climate was degenerating in sin. Sounds like a climate of today. And so all that to say, he was in a time in a day where people needed to hear the word of God, where they needed to hear the hope, where they needed to hear what the actual Passover meant, where all these festivals meant and what God was getting them out of and what they were getting them through, the Red Sea and all these things. And so this is kind of like the fire. That Josiah tried to start it. He said, hey, let's do something good for God. Let's do, and people are like, ah, it's not going to work. It's not going to matter. And so Saturday we were at a park in San Jacinto where drugs were abound everywhere. And we're in a park preaching the word of God and, and laying hands and praying for people and sharing the hope of Jesus with people. Some people say, oh, well, there, not many people came. But see, we have to start something for a revival to go. We have to do something. We have to act. We can't just sit back and say, well, it's probably not going to work. <laughs> you know, we have to have action and pray and have the Lord move on our part. And so this fire, this revival... When the king comes back to Jehoiakim, it's an evil king. It reminds me of when I went to Sunday school and I went to youth camps and you get on fire for God and you're excited and then Monday happens, which is school, and then you're like, oh, you put on that suit again. I'm a Christian, but I don't want to, I don't want to tell you I'm a Christian, but, uh, and then that fire dwindles because you forget the power of the word of God and you're embarrassed and you're ashamed and you don't want to be known as that Jesus freak or even one that carries the Bible in school. So you're like, hey, maybe I'll have it on my phone. You know, that's good enough. It is. <laughs> as long as you're reading it and know it. And it also reminds me of just the fire of God when you go through a camp meeting or anything like that. And we talked about, you know, I just came back from General Assembly. It was on fire and powerful. And then Caitlin goes in the hospital and this happens. And you're like, oh, but we can't, we have to let that fire continue on because I know what the Bible says, I know what the word of God says and he says, praise me and I'll take care of you. Be there and I'll take care of you. And so they've completely forgot God. God's done everything, he's done miracles in their lives for the Jews. He's like, you are my people and they're like, eh, but we don't want to be. So they've completely forgot God and went on living the way they wanted to. It was almost like the days of Judges, they did what was right in their own eyes in that sense. They're just like, eh, we're going to make idols, we're going to do this. The new king was wicked and the people were plunged into immorality. And this is the scene that we come into. Habakkuk, it left him wondering, Lord, why don't you judge your people? Why aren't you working? Where are you? Sometimes we look around in the news and say, God, where are you here? God, why aren't you intervening here? God, and, and, you know, Iraq, Iran, Ukraine, all these things. God, where are you? Habakkuk is a book written by a prophet who started out wrestling with God and ended up worshiping him. And that's, I can't wait to get to the end of this. <laughs> and we get to part where we go through all this, we wrestle with God, but then there's a point where we can worship God and say, hey, I see that you had a plan all along, that you were moving and that you were acting and that you were moving forward with action. Habakkuk 1.1, 1, 1. the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Habakkuk looked around and said, there is a burden I see. There's a burden going on. When I look out in the neighborhood, I see a burden. When I look at the park, I see people. I see the burden. I see the hurt. The, I see the need that people are hurting, and, and I see the lack of hope. Habakkuk, his name actually means <laughs> he that embraces or a wrestler. <laughs> Habakkuk was to embrace. And so you see him wrestling with God in the beginning of this, but then he gives it away to worship. Some scholars have called him the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament because in the beginning he wrestles. And John Corson states, this warrior right here will be a little overview of what we're going to go through, but John Corson states, in chapter 1, we see him wandering and wrestling. In chapter 2, we'll see him watching and waiting. In chapter 3, we'll see him worshiping and waiting, or in witnessing, sorry, worshiping and witnessing. In chapter 1, he begins in the valley. In chapter 2, he climbs the tower. In chapter 3, he ascends the mountain. In chapter 1, he sighs. In chapter 2, he'll 
seek. In chapter 3, he'll sing. Thus, this book bears his name as a great book for any of us who, at any time, wonder, where is God? End quote. And so that's kind of the, the themes that we're going to go through, that we start in the valley, that we go to the tower, then we ascend to the mountaintops, and that we're with God. And the difference between him and Jonah is that at the end, he praised, and Jonah at the end, he's like, why would you save those people? And so we'll see a contrast here. But he calls his writing a burden. He says, what I am here doing and what I'm seeing is a burden. When I looked up burden in Hebrew, it's masa, M-A-S-S-A, masa, meaning carry, load, or burden. It's derived from the noun nasa, meaning to carry, to lift up, to raise, and to bring. And we'll get into that in a minute. But this signifies what was lifted up was a burden. When you lift things up, it could be a burden. He saw the people that needed to be lifted up as a burden. And Habakkuk has a heavy message, and it is a weighty one, because it, it almost contrasts where we're at in today's world and how we see with the news but I believe there's a lot more people worshiping Jesus right now than in that time. I believe there's a lot of people that are still on fire for Jesus and that when we do have a revival, that it's going to be a real heart revival, that it's not going to just be an outward emotion, but it's going to be an inward compassion that we long to be with Jesus. And so for anyone that has gone through a tough time, which I look out here and I know we've all gone through tough times, especially being a smaller church, we know almost everybody's Think that they've gone through and we know what they've come out of and we can just see and, <laughs> and we know sometimes those burdens that they're carrying and we know the cries and the prayers that they pray at night and we can see that. And so I think we all can relate at these times but it's interesting when you, you look at this and you, you cry out for the land and you say, God, where are you? What are you doing? And sometimes we, 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 we question that and we wonder, especially with when evil things happen, you know, because we know God can just say it's done, but then we're like, God, why would you allow that to happen? These are the questions that we as Christians, as pastors have at times, and we just go to the Bible and we go, hey, I know that God is in control. I know that my God is alive and well, and I know that my God is faithful to the righteous, and so I'm just going to go with what I know, <laughs> the word of God, and just let God be God, but I'm going to pray, I'm going to seek, and I'm going to fast, and I want God to move. Habakkuk 1-2 O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. See, this is not new. People in the Old Testament were going through it. We're going through it now. You know, There's so much corruption and pain. He's crying out. He's like, there's violence in Judah. There's suffering. And Habakkuk is praying to God. And, and in his mind, he's feeling that nothing is happening and nothing is changing and God is not moving. And he's at the point of crying out to God. He, he did his prayer. He did his fasting. You know, he's, he did his rituals. And he's like, this is not working. And he's like, I need to do something more. And he's like, God, where are you? God, I, he starts shouting out to God. He says, God, I don't know what to do anymore. I, there's so much going on. I, I don't know how to fix it. What do we do, God? How? What can I do, God? Where, and he starts to cry out with passion to God. And he says, God, what can we do? It's in this desperation, in his intensity, in, his, in, the, in the heart. He said, he, I did the outward appearance stuff. You know, I, I, I did the, the outward appearance. He said, but now there's something inside that I'm crying out to God. He says, I'm shouting out to you. I do not know what to do. And it's in that desperation of crying out to God that he answers him. It's, it's that intensity when we get to that desperate situation that God answered him. God was there. God was moving. And God showed up. And he was there the whole time. Habakkuk was thinking, God, I don't see you. I know at times, God, why are we in the hospital again? God, why are we doing this again? God, God. At some point, we just say, God, show me why we're here. And so we can just get done with this and get it over with at times. He said, God, are you there? And I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll get there. But there is power in crying out to God. There is power. There's a blessing in crying out to God. In Psalms 50, 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. You see here, it's the, oh, I'm wrestling, but then you will glorify me, you will worship me. When you're in trouble, call to me, and then there will be a time of worship. There will be a time that we can get through this. We are told when the day of trouble comes upon us, that he will deliver us, and we will turn to worship. I know every prayer that I've been answered. Thank you, God, for getting Caitlin out of here. Thank you for getting Benaiah out of here. Thank you for Marty being here, not on oxygen at the moment. You know, we, we give those praise. We turn it to worship. 
And we need to remember those <laughs> times because a lot of times we like to cry out in the pain and forget to cry to God in the good times. It's in that, that desperation that we seek God with our heart. It's, it's in those times where we seek God with all we can. When the good times are coming, we're on the outward. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for letting me wake up. All right, where's that coffee? Okay, good. And we move on. But it's when we're in pain that we truly go to the heart of the issue. And so I want us to get to the point where in the good times, we cry out to God, thank you for saving my son. Thank you for saving my husband. Thank you for being there in those times that were hard and tough. God, thank you for those. See, it's natural for us to, to <laughs> when we're hurting, to cry out. Even me as a pastor, I'll pray more than usual when Caitlin's in the hospital. I'll pray more when I hear a testimony. I'll pray more when I hear that somebody's terminally ill. I'll start to pray more. It's natural. I'll start to cry out to God more. Even as a pastor, it's when there's a burden in my life that I need to lift it up to God. You know, the, the term nasa, to bring my burdens to God, to lift it up to God, is when we cry out to God the most. Jeremiah 33.3 3, he says, call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Whew, I love that. He says, in your time of trouble, call to me and I am doing great and mighty things that you do not know. And I look out in the crowd and I see those answered and those great and mighty things that we did not know. There are times we thought that that person might not have made it, but they're here today with us. There's times where we're in the hospital saying, God, is this it? And they're here today with us. There's those times that God said, you know what? All those desperate prayers that you've had, I want you to look back and see the great and mighty things that God did. I want you to go into a journal and say, God, when I cried out to you, and I want you to see that great and mighty works that God did, and I guarantee you, you'll, you'll see it. You'll be like, oh, I didn't even realize that. Some of you might not even remember that prayer you prayed. That's why it's so important to, to write down at times because I guarantee you those desperation cries, and you look back, you'll see a great and mighty works that God did. I see that in my children every day. I see that in the congregation. I see that with people that I know that we've prayed for. We've got to look for the great and mighty works. God says, I, if you call out to me, I am doing great and mighty works. To so look out at that. In Psalms 34, 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. He says, if you follow me and you do what I say in the Bible and you follow the Bible... When troubles will come, it says, it doesn't say I'll keep you from the troubles. It says when the troubles come, you call out to me and I will deliver you. Those are the promises that we have. And if we don't know those promises, then we can't cry out to God with knowing that God will move. See, when I cry out to God in desperation, I know he's going to move because the Bible tells me so. And if the word is taken away from me, I know it's in my heart because I've read it. It's, I've hidden it in my heart. And so I know that I can cry out to God and he will answer. It says, because the righteous cry out and the Lord hears because God knows he hears the complaints. He says, I'm here. <laughs> you know, all those, where are you, Lord? I'm here. Where are you, Lord? I'm here. Where are you, Lord? I'm right here. Where are you? He said, I'm right here. And so when you know that and you cry out to Lord and said, said, Lord, I know you're here, but show yourself to me. But show yourself to me. I need that peace right now, God. I need to be wrapped in your love right now. I am going through pain right now. I need the robe of Jesus to cover me and wash away my sins and, and, and my healing, God. I need a healing in my life right now. I need a mental breakdown. <laughs> Not a mental breakdown. I need a mental breakup. <laughs> I'm going through a mental breakdown, God. I need you to lift me up. This burden that I see, I need you to help me fix it. I need you to be inside of it to fix the situations that I see. And we cry out, God will hear us. The scriptures are there for us so that when we do have doubts, that we know that God is going to show up. And I expect my Jesus to show up. We do not want to be like Jehoiakim and take the word, cut it up, and throw it into the fire. We need to have it. We need to have it in our hearts. We need to know what it is. It will change our lives and it will cause a revival of God in your life. It will revive your marriage. It will revive your relationships, your companies, and everything. When you put the word of God in it, when you put it in you and share it, God will bless you and he'll be there for you. And when you're going through trouble, he says, cry out to me and it will turn to worship. And sometimes when we're crying out, saying, God, I don't know what to do, it just turns into worship. Jesus, make better. Jesus, make better. <laughs> and then it just says, Jesus, Jesus. And so what I love about this is that when we go through some God promises, there will be a time where we can worship. There will be a time where we'll have peace. 
Habakkuk says, Lord, how long will I cry, pleads Habakkuk. The second time he uses the word cry, it literally means scream. He says, Lord, I'm crying out to you. Lord, I'm screaming out to you. <laughs> he, was, he had that intensity in his heart. He says, Lord, I've cried and now I'm screaming. I am shouting. I, I need something to happen. There's a time where we pray, okay, God, do this. But then there's a time where we say, God, this is life or death. God, you have to show up right now. God, I need you to show up right now. And you get in that intensity and that heart gets involved into it. Whew. I cry to you, Lord, but you do not hear me. I scream out before you, but you do not help me. That's what's going on here. And I'll back up one three. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. I feel them. <laughs> you can look at the news for the last few years and, and continuing on, and it literally is that scripture. There's violence, there's riots, there's looting, there's... <laughs> lawlessness. You can look around and say there's nothing good going on. You can look at the news in America and see what is going on, the indoctrination and things that are trying to put on the kids, the identity issues, school shootings, corruption and everything, invading of other countries. You're like, oh God, what is going on? I, I don't want to send my kid to school. I don't want to do this. I'm a, and you can start to live in fear. But we need to cry out to God. And as writing this on Friday night, I looked up at the headline, the top headline. I just typed in a news headline. And it was, Zelensky warns world is on verge of a nuclear disaster. More explosions reported at Russian military sites. That was two hours of looking at that. that. That's what the news is right now. There's nuclear war potentially, and all this is going on. But sin is abounding everywhere, and according to Habakkuk, he feels that God was indifferent and idle. I think sometimes that we can like, hey, is God going to move? We're still waiting. It's been two years since the pandemic. I've seen little bits of God moving, but I want to see a movement. You know, God, are you actually moving? Are you doing this? And we know he is. We've, we've seen God moving. But he asked, why have you caused me to witness this iniquity? In other words, why aren't you judging the people and, and acting judgment upon them and, and doing something about this evil? He says, why aren't you doing something about this evil right now? You know what? God is a loving, caring, kind, and just God. Noah had a hundred years to build a boat and witness to people before the flood ever came. A hundred years. People, oh, he just flooded the whole, he gave him a hundred years to repent. After that, I mean, they're not going to repent. Uh, that's, that's the whole point. But God's giving us time to reach the world, to time to talk to our loved ones, to get them to know Jesus. God is giving us time. He says, yes, the times are coming to the end. You know, the disciples were living in the end. <laughs> we're living in the end, just in the ender end of the end. But <laughs> I don't think that's uh, theologically correct, but we're in the end times of the end times. And so it's time that we, we cry out to people and say, hey, I've got hope for you. I, I know that there's a lot of evil going on, but I have hope for you. Habakkuk 1.4 says, Therefore, law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surrounds the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. You can just look at the news and see that. You can see the politicians, whatever. You can, you can just name whatever you want and pretty much probably got some corruption in it. You know, the Bible's taken out of schools. We talked about the things that are good called bad and the things that are bad called good now. We're seeing that. Powerless is translated in the Hebrew word paralyzed. It says the law is paralyzed. It's, it's not working. The Jewish system is not functioning. And so it appears that the wicked was uncontested and that wickedness was going to be abound everywhere. And it seemed like that today at times. I look around, but I know King Jesus. I know what the Bible says, and it's going to get worse. <laughs> but God says, I'm going to take my people out of here. And that's why it's so important to tell everybody about Jesus and that hope. And it's not all doom and gloom because we'll have a heaven. We'll have a place where we'll be with our family once again. A backup situation in his day was perilous, full of danger and risk. Right now in America, we have it pretty easy. If you go to a different country and try to preach Jesus for the word, there's danger and risk. And so we must, since we are free at the moment, do what we can to let the world know about Jesus. And it says, you know, history will repeat itself. In Ecclesiastes 1.9 it says, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new underneath the sun. Seems like we're repeating history. And so what's so great about this is, is that there's a chance 
to set people free in Jesus. Things may go back to the day of backup with evil leaders and, and corruption going on. We're seeing parts of the corruption going on and that. But we need to cry out to God and know that there's a blessing in it for ourselves, for our families, for our church, for our neighbors, for our cities, for, our, for the countries of the world, for everybody. You know, well, I want world peace, but I want everybody to know world peace, which is Jesus. And that's what I want to put on people is, is Jesus. And so we need to pray that that hope, that they can have a life giver because someone that's in the lowest part only can come up. And they're in that valley. The only place is they can come up. And so we want to encourage people. We need to bring them to Jesus, the lost loved ones to Jesus. Instead of complaining about all the bad and, and all this is that's going on, and instead of complaining, oh, this is corrupt, this is corrupt, how about we start praying? How about we start praying? And how about we start telling people, hey, Jesus can fix this. Jesus can make better. Jesus can make better. Hey, I know the solution, Jesus. I know the hope, it's Jesus. And we start telling everybody that it's okay. Hey, we have Jesus. And if we just keep praying, and we need to be that loving Jesus, because that's, you know, Christians got a bad rep, so we need to be the love of Jesus to the world. It's okay to question God and ask, where are you? But we need to know what the Bible says. And that's what the faith is that we have, is we believe the word of God. He literally gave us the whole instructions. And he says, just have faith. But he gave us every answer, every solution. He gave us the step-by-step -step program and says, just have faith that this works. So faith is, for me now, is almost easy. It's just, I have faith that this is real. I have faith that God's going to move. And I believe in the word of God. So I don't really need faith anymore because I have faith that this is the Word of God. So now I'm, I'm able to walk in the Word of God and be there. You know, God is there even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it. God knows everything and He's in control. Even in all the chaos that we see, God says, I've got the whole world in my hands. I look at the testimonies of Joseph. He was betrayed by family, faked his death, sold to slavery, but my God turned what the devil meant for evil and made him a ruler in a different country. Daniel, taken in this Babylonian excursion, taken and raised up to power. But he had to learn the occult. He had to learn evil ways and practices. And he became in charge. He became a leader. So God knows what he's doing at times. And it's going to take some of us to step up in those times and be leaders during dark times, during hard times. So know what the word of God says because if it's taken away, you need to have it in your heart. And you need to know it. Follow the law of God, follow his commands, and he will protect you. He'll make good out of the bad. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray right now that you would move in us. We pray that when we look out, instead of complaining, that we just continue to pray. We pray with that intensity that we cry out to you when we're in pain, Father. We cry out to you when we need something, Father. But now we need to start to cry out for other people that need you. We need to start crying out for our lost loved ones, our sons, our daughters, our mothers, our fathers. We just pray right now that you would help us to have a real revival, a real revelation of who you are, that in our heart we know when we have a relationship with you, that we don't have to just go through the, the rituals of who you are, Father, the, the religion of Jesus, but we can have the relationship with you, Father that we can walk in love, that when we see sin, that we don't just go out there and beat it, Father, but we can be a loving hand and say, hey, I've got a way that will change your life. God, that you would help us, that you would put people in our paths that we can be a witness to, Father God. We pray that you would put people on our hearts that we need to pray for, continuously pray for them, Father. We pray that you would just help us to help this nation, Father. We pray for our family members. We pray for the church members, Father, but we pray for this community, this neighborhood. We pray that you would put up a passion and desire, that intensity for the lost, Father. It says that the one sheep goes away, but all of heaven rejoices when it comes back, Father. We're praying for that intensity right now, Father. We pray that when we look out and see the burden, that we can be uplifters of that burden, that we can lift it and bring it to you, God. We just pray that you would just continue to guide us and strengthen us and lead us in our families, in our schools, in our jobs, and everywhere we're at, that we can be a, a light of Jesus, that we can be hope bringers in the darkness, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.